Well, good, uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for Equality uh, Imperative. Uh, before we start the meeting, I wanted to introduce you uh, to Avi Lidvog. We came with our, uh, with our very famous dog, Ali. And, uh, and to our other panelist, Alma uh, Rivzi, who came with a six-year-old baby. Six months. Uh, six months old, yeah. Uh, six months old baby, sorry about that. Uh, and, and those should definitely stay with us for the entire duration of the <laughs> workshop. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to have this, uh, this conversation today. It, it comes uh, after several conversations that we have had on issues that face LGBTI people. Uh, last, the last conversation we had was on older people uh, and aging as LGBT, particularly the impact of COVID-19 on older LGBT people. Before that, we had a conversation with Sean Straub on HIV criminalization. And before that, we had Mathieu Shurka, who talked about conversion therapy. And then we had uh, Frédéric Martel, who came to talk to us about religion on LGBTI issues. So, um, so today the topic is mass incarceration. Before we, we start the meeting, I wanted to give a shout out to our member companies that are sponsoring our uh, webinar series, uh, including American Express, City, Goldman Sachs, Robs and Gray, that Salma uh, belongs to, MasterCard, Bloomberg, and of course, uh, Gibson. So, uh, you know, we're probably going to exchange uh, uh, about uh, on the topic for 45 minutes, and then there will be 50 minutes to, uh, for Salma and Avi to respond to questions you may have. So do not hesitate to put uh, your questions in the, in the question section and we'll raise them uh, towards, uh, towards the end. So uh, uh, briefly, because they will get the opportunity to talk about what they do, um, Avi is the executive director of Witness to Mass Incarceration, which is uh, a, a, a pretty new organization that is, that is about, I think, two, uh, two years old. Uh, three years old now, that has, uh, that has become a huge player in raising awareness on issues of mass incarceration, particularly for LGBT people, uh, but also giving the tools to formerly incarcerated people to succeed in, uh, in their return to life. And I think Evie will have a great opportunity to talk about that. And then, uh, and then we have, of course, Alma Rizzi, who uh, works at Robs and Gray, and uh, I've done you know, a lot of pro bono uh, cases. And one of her cases that she has worked on is uh, very famous because it was a success. And it led uh, to, uh, to change on, uh, in Rikers Island, uh, here, right here in New York. But besides that, uh, uh, Salma also worked on uh, issues of LGBT inclusion in schools. And I, I think she will get to talk uh, about that. So Evi, my first question will go to you. Uh, I think what is um, what has come out of, of, of the discussion around COVID-19 and incarcerated people is that we realize that people's sense of community tend to stop at incarcerated people and uh, formerly incarcerated people. And I think that one of your specificities is that you are yourself a formerly incarcerated people. And so that in, and in many ways, we see that you are part of our community. And that has been the strength of your testimony. C could you share a, a little bit about your experience and, and, uh, and, and you know, what happened to you? So I want to thank you, Fabrice, for inviting me to speak at Out Leadership. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I am a formerly incarcerated Jewish lesbian and the daughter of two survivors of the Holocaust. I say this because those intersections uh, impacted me in prison. I lost my mom, who survived Auschwitz. I lost her to COVID on April 5th. I was incarcerated at two federal women's prisons and spent time in solitary confinement. I was released roughly five years ago. I'm going to give you a little background to my story. Um, when I say in 2009, 2010, I was living with my mother. Um, she was physically disabled and... The night before I left for prison, she said to me, I want to talk to you about something. I said, okay. She had very serious look. She was about four, nine, four feet, nine inches. And she said, prison is going to be harder for you than concentration camp was for me. And I said, mom, are you crazy? You were in Auschwitz. How can you compare the two? She said, I was 12 years old. You're 60. 
And it was later when I was in solitary confinement that I would think about more of what she said, which is I was young, a child. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, you're 60, you're old. I didn't like her saying I was old, but you're gonna have memories every day of what happened to you when she was right. So the moment you enter prison, you know you've left the free world. I arrived at a federal prison in West Virginia in 2010. An officer took me into a cold and dingy room. Um, and I was told to give me one, told to strip in front of an officer. She made me pee in front of her. She asked me to lift my breasts so she could check for contraband. And then she asked me to bend over um, and cough so she could check my anus and vagina. And in that moment, I was more humiliated than at other, any other time in my life. I knew I had to shut down. I, had, I couldn't cry, I couldn't scream. I could have no reaction. And um, I had to find the coping skills to deal with it. Um, so I was assigned to a unit. It's like an orientation unit and uh, where I met, uh, and I was a newbie. And you stay there for about two weeks. Um, several of the veterans walked over to me and said, if you wanna do easy time, you have to stay under the radar. And that means no officer knows your name, no warden knows your name. Um, well, I was a baby of the women's gay rights and civil rights movement from back in the day. And I could not, I was an old experienced activist and I could not check my activism at the door. So it took less than one hour for me to literally be on everybody's radar. Um, people walk over to you and uh, the first person who walked over to me said, are you married, do you have children? I said, no, I'm not, not married and I don't have kids. Second woman, are you married, do you have children? No, I'm not married, I don't have children. So after the fourth woman asked me, are you, you know, the same question, I thought to myself, well, I came out to my mother like 40 years ago. And what my mother said is, if Hitler didn't kill me, you will, which I thought was, which is the title of a book I'm trying to work on. Um, and I decided with the next person, I'm not going back in the closet. I didn't think it through. So the next person that came over uh, said, are you married? Do you have kids? I said, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I'm a lesbian. She said, can I see the pictures you have brought in? Because you're allowed to bring in 25 pictures. So I happened to have 25 pictures of Allie, my dog. And this woman screamed, this old lesbian has 25 pictures of her dog. So it took less than an hour for the entire compound, 1,300 women to know not only that I was a lesbian, but that I only had pictures of my dog. So much for being under the radar. Within a week, the unit manager where I was called me into her office and she opened by saying, I understand you're an open lesbian. So I said, uh, I'm also an open feminist and an open Jew. Um, she, she ignored me and said, several women have complained that you've been touching their ass. And I thought, and I started, I almost uh, jumped at her and I, I'm in prison, I'm screaming at an officer, how dare you? How dare anybody accuse me? I'm here, I've been, uh, I haven't been with anybody in 10 years. Do you think I'm gonna start in prison? Um, I put myself in a very dangerous position by coming out. There were plenty of lesbians there, but nobody actually said they were one. Me having opened up uh, caused me to be punished for the entire time. I was in prison. So by the time I left her office and walked to my bed, she took me out of this nicer unit and put me in a unit called the ghetto and put me in a place to sleep, which was referred to as the bus stop. And this was ten, seven to 10 days into my prison sentence. So the bus stop, if you can imagine with me a room where 150 women sleep, and imagine that the entire ceiling is filled with fluorescent lighting. And at 11 o'clock PM, that lighting goes off and it is really dark enough to sleep for the women that are in the sleeping unit. But the bus stop is located in front of the sleeping unit and um, those lights are kept on. So there were 10 bunks with 20, what is that? 
don't, don't worry. Sorry. I thought right. I turned it off. Sorry about that. Um, I did turn it off. Okay. Um, so you're, you're, the woman who is sleeping on the top bunk bed is five feet away from all the fluorescent lighting. And in front of me was an ice machine, which cracked down every 20 minutes. And on either side of me were the bathrooms and showers, which 150 women used um, all night long. So by putting me in the bus stop for being a lesbian, and they told me that, um, there was no way to sleep. Um, also, most women who are over the age of 60, and I was 60, um, are given jobs. You have to work in prison. You have to get up at 6.30, you have to be at work by 8 o'clock, you have to do certain things at certain hours. Uh, by uh, Instead of putting me in the chapel or in an indoor setting where I'd mop a floor and then sit down and read a book, uh, they put me in landscaping and gave me a lawnmower from the 1950s, which I couldn't even move. But then uh, in in West Virginia, the summers are night are... 90 to 100 degrees and in the winter they wanted me to shovel snow and I have a I have a heart condition and they know this so I'm outside uh, and because I couldn't start that uh, lawnmower they decided to give me a different task which was to give me a broom to sweep rocks off of the main road which was physically extremely taxing for me so in both prisons, um, medical care is essentially, I was in two different prisons. I, my conviction was overturned after the first time I was in prison, but one count remained. So I ended up going to court. I wouldn't plead guilty to it. And I knew I was facing a second term in prison. So in both prisons, about 1,300 women each, um, there's only a, a physician's assistant who's there three times a week, and one x-ray machine, which you don't want to go near because it was probably built in like 1940. It's bigger than a room, you know, and, and that's it. So if you need an ultrasound, a scan, an MRI, you're out of luck. They do not send you. I came into prison uh, bleeding um, when I went to the bathroom, and it was scare it scared me, and that was in July, and I showed a guard because you have to prove it, and it took them six months to send me for a colonoscopy. So when someone's bleeding and you know, here, you go right to the hospital, they don't care. They don't report deaths as you'll see later. So if you get cancer in prison, even if it's caught early, they're just not gonna send you out for surgery or they're gonna wait a year and a half, at which point, instead of it being one breast needing to be taken off, you're, you have a death sentence and six months left to live. And unfortunately, I know too many people like that. So one person, a physician's assistant, saw all 1,300 women in the prison I was at. And no matter whether you walked in with a cyst, uh, cancer, uh, a, a broken leg, he said the same thing to each woman. Um, you're fat, walk on the track, drink water. So a woman named Miriam Hernandez was in serious, seriously bad condition. She walked in, he gave her the fat speech, and she died two weeks later when her gallbladder uh, burst. And I was so furious because I knew that if he had taken a blood test, she would be alive today. Frankly, a lot of the people that died in prison would be alive had they had even the most minimum of care. Um, so I wrote an article, which I did regularly, and I normally send it snail mail so that the guards don't, don't, generally leave, don't generally read the outgoing mail. But this time I sent it on email. And an hour after it was posted, I was arrested, shackled, and sent to solitary. And I had only three weeks left to being in, incarcerated. And they said, we'll keep you here as long as we want. And they could have kept me for about three years. But fortunately... Um, I was not fortunately or unfortunately, I was in solitary for about two months and I physically, mentally and emotionally have never recovered. And I doubt I ever will recover from that experience. Thank you. Solitary. So, so we'll, we will, we will come back, uh, uh, to your, to your experience solitary because, you know, it, it does, it does, uh, 
apply to to to, uh, to some of, of what is happening now in COVID nineteen. I would love to to tell to tell you to that. Okay. But so you point out the, the the terrible condition of incarceration in in many places, and also the discrimination that LGBT people experience. The discrimination that LGBT people experience when they go to jail. And so I think that's a good segue because you you haven't talked yet, and I know that that this is a topic that you also talk about, which is violence in jail and violence uh, from uh, sometimes the guards themselves. And so I think that's a good segue to the to uh, to the experience of Salma when she uh, when when her, her firm um, and 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 she was part of the team. Uh, uh, you know, succeeded in, in bringing a class action lawsuit uh, against the city of New York called Nunez uh, versus city of New York, in which um, in which she basically uh, uh, they basically denounced staff violence against inmates. So, so Salma, can you give us a little bit of background around the case and and also uh, and also you know tell us eventually what happened when when you when you went to court. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on this panel with both of you. I admire the work you both do, and um, there's so much more work ahead, so I hope we can continue to work together. Uh, so to give you some background on Rikers, which you both are familiar with, and most of the audience must be as well, but Rikers um, is a, a jail system that opened in the 1930s, and it's been notorious for violence for a number of decades. Most of the inmates ho ho housed at Rikers are not guilty, and many are locked up for false charges. It's, it's usually a place for poor, those who cannot afford bail, and they're awaiting uh, pretrial hearings. And so there's some uh, young men particularly who are stuck in Rikers for not even being able to afford $1,000 in bail before their hearings um, can be seen before a judge. Uh, many have been suffering excruciating violence um, and the guards have been known for helping to facilitate gangs. Today, there are eight facilities, 8,000 inmates and a ratio of one to about one to three for, for, per staff member to inmate. Um, by 2026, New York City plans to shut down Rikers Island uh, jails and push the inmates to boroughs. There is also a lack of access to basic health care. Just a report came out last week that one of 10 inmates had tested positive for COVID-19 and the spread is not being controlled. So as it regards to my work in this lawsuit, in 2011, the Legal Aid Society, the Prisoner Rights Project particularly, uh, brought a 1983 uh, civil rights lawsuit. So under the U.S. Uh, code uh, 42 U.S.C. section 1983, civilians can sue governments or anyone acting under the co color of a government or a state law for civil rights violation. Civil rights are rights that are established by the U.S. Constitution and the Eighth Amendment prohibit governments from ex imposing excessive bail, fines, and cruel and unusual punishment. This is where our lawsuit came in, where we stated that inmates at Rikers Island were being subjected to cruel and unusual punishment. They were being beaten in areas with no cameras by guards. They um, guards were guards were imposing brutal force, uh, re resulting in fractured bones, traumatic brain injuries, internal bleeding, concussions. Uh, needing hospitalization and surgeries. And worst of all was that the Department of Correction officers falsified documents and fabricated disciplinary methods after these brutal incidents were reported. What the judge found and what many judges in the past have found is that there is indeed a pattern of practice of the use of force against inmates and in violation of their rights when it comes to Rikers Island. In 2012, Ropes and Gray joined this case as well as a civil rights boutique called Emory Chelly. By 2013, the magistrate judge, Francis, granted class certification. This meant that all present and future inmates confined in jails operated by the New York City Department of Corrections were able to join our case. Um, so this became one of the, the greatest and, and biggest uh, prison reform litigation cases in history. Meanwhile, while this was happening from 2011 to 2013, U.S. Um, uh, the United States uh, offices uh, in the Southern District of New York had been investigating the treatment of minors at Rikers Island under the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act. 
They found excessive use of force, inadequate uh, supervision, and prolonged solitary confinement. They issued this finding letters in 2014. Then by, the two th by 2014, the Department of Justice U.S. Attorney's Office joined our case. And here now we had the Legal Aid Society, Ropes and Gray, Emery Chelly, and the U.S. Attorney's Office all on one side in order to achieve change. A private firm, a public interest uh, um, firm, the government, and a legal aid society working to achieve justice for Rikers inmates. By 2015, the city, there was no way of hiding what was happening at Rikers Island. And so the city agreed to engage in a settlement rather than battle uh, many years of litigation and trials to come. So essentially what we did with the 11 named plaintiffs is that we worked to get damages for the suffer that they endured. And then we uh, worked on a settlement decree that would provide adjunctive relief to prevent future abuses at Rikers Island. At that time, the New York um, City Mayor, Mayor de Blasio, and, the, and uh, Joseph Ponte, who was the Department of Corrections Commissioner, and Zach Carter, who were the co uh, corporate counsel, they wholeheartedly wanted, wanted to engage in the settlement uh, decree. And that's where I began work on the case in 2015. Um, this was an extremely painstaking, time-consuming settlement that resulted in a 60-page consent decree. Uh, it resulted in over 50 meetings um, that were all-day-long meetings, eight, nine, ten hours. And at these meetings, uh, they happened about two to three times a week. It essentially took up most of our pro bono docket at the time. And Ropes and Gray's support staff, paralegals, food services were working around the clock to ensure that everybody at the table was committed to um, the settlement decree and, and within the settlement decree, the, the reforms that we outlined. The purpose of the decree was to, um, you know, es essentially change the culture at Rikers Island. And uh, this required much social negotiation. On one side of the table was all the city's attorneys and the other side of the long table was all our ropes and gray attorneys and Emery Chelly and um, Legal Aid Society. I was involved with drafting the pre preliminary approval um, uh, which we showed before the judge in October 2015 where I outlined how the consent decree we drafted abided by the law um, and how this historic agreement with landmark reforms would help to prevent future abuses against those at Riker Island. And so some of the decree changes and reforms included new policies for juvenile principals, uh, for, for juvenile prisoners. And this was really the result of the U.S. Attorney's Office who had done that letter in 2014 showing all of the abuse that juveniles face at Rikers Island. Um, one such change stated that Juveniles could no longer be forced into solitary confinement if you're under the age of 18. If you're over the age of 18, um, but you have a history, a psychiatric history, you are not able to be subjected to solitary confinement. There's also the installation of 7,800 cameras in the jail complex. Um, there's an explicit prohibition on high impact force, strikes to the head, face, groin, ne neck. And, uh, and correction officers were no longer allowed to use force in response to verbal insults by in inmates, and public communication with inmates was no longer allowed. There were strict reporting protocols to any use of force, and prompt and fair discipline was required. Most importantly, a federal monitor, Steve Martin, uh, was implemented in order to um, report every, every, every quarter on what was happening at Rikers Island. And the lead attorney at, on, on this case for Ropes and Gray, Anna Friedberg, she actually left Ropes and Gray to be his deputy monitor because she cared about this case so much. Um, when it comes to human rights, the Southern District of New York judge, Judge Wayne, said in her remarks when she approved this landmark consent decree the following. The way we treat inmates not only affects the lives of those individuals, but it, con it conveys important messages about how we as a society value these individuals and the communities to which they return. Judge Swain stated such serious attention to the safety, supervision, and monitoring of inmates and corrections personnel alike requires and confirms the recognition of the worth and dignity of every human being. Now, this happened in um, 
2015 and now it's 2020 and you might ask what's been happening with it? has the consent decree worked and unfortunately the last report of the federal monitor that was issued in june 2019 before corona hit had the following um ha had the following remarks and i will just quote them while the pace of reform is not stagnant and the department has taken several steps to advance reforms, the department has not shown itself capable of devising and implementing effective strategies to fully institutionalize the use of force reforms required by the consent decree. Staff are often hyper-confrontational and respond to incidents in a manner that is hasty, hopeless, thoughtless, reckless, careless. Staff demonize inmates and exacerbate the use of force. Failure by agency personnel at virtually all levels to, uh, to actively, directly, and consistently enforce provisions of the use of force directive have failed. There's been a failure to conduct timely, reliable investigations on the use of force, failure to impose meaningful discipline, failure to consistently hold accountable supervisors. In response to all of this, the the now act the the now Department of Correction um, Commissioner Cynthia Brand, who succeeded Joseph who succeeded Joseph Ponce, said, "The safety and well-being of people who make and live in our facilities is our top priority." And this latest monitor's report makes clear there are no easy solutions, and we have hard work ahead of us when it comes to reducing violence and the inappropriate use of force. Ultimately, prisoners continue to be treated inhumanely. Despite extensive reform, the law commanding better behavior, the court system imploring compliance, penalties in place for non-compliance, all of these changes do not necessarily change the culture of decades old violence against inmates. In conclusion, we need a cultural sift of how inmates are seen. They are humans, most in jail are innocent, yet locked up due to racist policing. Had many of these inmates been more affluent, they would have not been sitting at Rikers. The case of Rikers is one rippled with the need for greater economic and racial justice in order to reform our criminal justice system. And the plan to quickly shift inmates by 2026 will not solve the diseases of the hearts of those who inflict violence upon our most vulnerable in society, our prisoners who, for, whose freedom is already severely restricted. Ultimately, this is not about buildings, but it is about people. This is where greater activism and communal healing and societal changes come in when the justice system and the law ultimately fail. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Thalma. What, what a powerful, uh, what a powerful conclusion. And uh, I, I love the fact that you know both in uh, in the decision and in that uh, report. There is a discussion of community and society and the fact that, you know, inmates are part of our community. And I think that's something that AV has been working very hard, uh, a, a, a point of view that AV has been working very hard to promote uh, through uh, going through the United States and talking about this issue. So AV, that kind of brings me to my, to my next question, which, right. is, <laughs> which is, you know, what Salma points out is that is that there is a need for litigation, uh, but that sometimes change in the law is not enough. There is also a need for a uh, change of culture. What is your point of view on how you right. articulate activism and, and litigation? So first, thank you, Salma. I really enjoyed what you said, and I hope that what I'm about to say doesn't offend any attorney. Um, you can't change this culture, period. It's never going to happen. Uh, there'll never be a report where they don't lie. Now, and I don't believe litigation is the answer. Um, I'm a baby of the women's movement. I participated and saw the passage of civil rights, voting rights in Roe versus Wade. And you look in the last 10 years and you see that they disappear. Um, what I do, what I, the law, getting a law passed is one portion of the issue. But two other portions of the issue are, can you get it enforced and can you get it appropriated? So I have never, I uh, was given a grant by the Department of Justice to examine sexual violence against LGBTQ people um, in prison. My conclusions were as followed. The law uh, called PREA, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, 
was signed by Congress in 2003. That law prohibited officers from touching, harassing, or sexually being involved with any inmate. But I was in 2013 at FCI Tallahassee, where I personally saw 20 out of 21 male officers sleeping with four to six women a day. It's open. It's out there. We all know it. And it's like we live in three different worlds, prison, the legal system, and the educators, and then those of us who come home who know that there's a, such a big disconnect that it's not funny. The PREA law, it's 17 years later, and all an officer has to do is walk over to a woman and say, do you want to see your kids this weekend? And she says yes, being very confused as to why he's even asking this question. And he says, well, then I want a blowjob. No camera catches this. No amount of laws catch this. And if she says no, she's either going to solitary where she won't see her kid, or he transfers her from Florida, which they can do, and nobody's ever examined the transfers. And they're directly connected to sexual violence because women in prisons are put in solitary primarily because they've said no to an officer or they've said yes and the officer remains nervous that this woman is going to tell on him. So uh, if you say no, you're gonna, you could, they could send you from to Wisconsin or California where you'll never see your kids again. Um, second part, the first step back, which I don't like because it did too little and it replaced a much more important law that was in the Senate, which would have changed mandatory minimums and impacted a lot more people. But second, first step just passed and they had one component in it that was decent for reentry, uh, but it, reentry programming. But the second part of why I don't like the legislative fix is they're not appropriated. The funding doesn't come. So no funding went to reentry. Um, I am very discouraged because there has been no oversight behind bars. There'll never be uh, oversight behind bars. You would have to change all the correctional officers and swap in social workers and psychologists and treat prison as a different, not a prison environment, but as a rehabilitative environment and not a punishment environment. The only way I know to do that is to blow up every prison because they're physically disgusting and physically hard on your body. If you're in prison over the age of 50, you're gonna age 15 years and your body's gonna age and it happened to me. No, I, you have to not build new jails, but you have to build wellness facilities. You have to put people in and have the will to want to see these people change. Thank you so much, Evie. Um, so, Salma, you know, uh, of course, Evie's point of view is that is that you know, uh, uh, litigation is, is not going to be enough, and that in fact, uh, uh, it, it has to be a society change. You know, I, first of all, I would love to to hear you discuss some things that 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 you had mentioned in a call we had, which was Foucault's point of view on the the, the commonality of uh, schools and uh, and institutions like jail. And in, in that context, I would love to hear about that other pro bono case in which you succeeded in getting Utah state law that prohibited discussion of homosexuality in school, which, which you know, is baffling because, you know, why would we choose to change reality in school? But you did meet uh, some success here. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I would love for you to talk about, um, about, about how you see, when it comes to human rights, the role of litigation. Yeah, thanks so much. So I'll um, thank you so much, Avi, for your comments uh, as always. And I agree that we we need wellness centers more than prisons in this country. Um, so to give you some background, in 1994, President Clinton uh, had passed the Defense of Marriage Act, and this sparked a number of laws around the country that prohibited the encouragement of homosexuality. Um, it wasn't until about almost over 20 years later, in 2015 our Supreme Court practices at Ro a partner at Ropes and Gray, D uh, Doug Dreamile Hallward, successfully argued Obergefell ver versus Hodges, Amer the marriage equality case. Um, and essentially that case said that U.S. laws cannot discriminate based on a person's homosexuality 
or sexual orientation. So we essentially took that Supreme Court case from 2015 and we used it as both a shield to protect the LGBT community and a sword to slash laws and state legislatures that were homophobic. So in October 2016, Ropes and Gray, as lo uh, alongside Equality Utah and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, filed a federal lawsuit challenging Utah laws that restricted classroom discretion regarding the LGBT community. These laws are in many states. They're referred to as no promo homo laws, prohibiting the mention or discussion of homosexuality and transgender identity in public schools. In January 2017, we filed a motion for preliminary injunctive relief, which prevented enforcement of these state laws that restrict classroom discussions and student clubs um, that include supportive speech about homosexuality in Utah public schools. We argue that uh, under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which says that no state shall deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection under the law, that every person has equal worth and equal free speech rights. We argue that these no promo homo laws discriminate based on sexual orientation by prohibiting instruction, classroom discussion, and student clubs involving supportive speech about homosexualities. We further argue that the student club laws violate the First Amendment free speech rights of students. And the sole purpose of these laws was for Utah to express its moral disapproval of homosexuality, which the U.S. Supreme Court in Obergefell had had is not a legitimate basis for laws to discriminate based on a person's uh, sexual orientation. So laws that center uh, supportive speech about LGBT people in schools create a toxic culture of silence and shame for these LGBT students. Um, and schools should totally be a place where young people feel safe and supported, not made to feel that their very existence is too shameful and stigmatized to even be acknowledged. So my role in this case was essentially client interfacing, to speak to these young students, to hear their voices, to write their declarations, which supported our litigation moves in um, the federal district in Utah. One of my clients, uh, um, we'll call him John Doe One, was bullied for being gay. Um, he experienced a hate crime where his backpack was taken, he was hurt, he was humiliated. And then in school, he tried to present a family history of his uncle being married to another man and that, that history was censored immediately by his teacher. Another student, John Doe II, was a, a gender non-conforming uh, student, and he wanted to read My Princess Boy in class. Um, and this book, which was his favorite book, was seen as promoting his, his homosexuality. And here we can see that the lines were blurred um, between not only what classified someone as belonging to the LGBT community, but also someone who is gender non-conforming. And the law does not deal with uh, the, these people who identify themselves as such very, very adequately. So this young boy was sexually assaulted in the bathroom. The school could not protect him and his mom ended up homeschooling him, which resulted in a number of financial burdens. Lastly, um, Janet Doe, uh, her sexual education was denied. She was a lesbian who couldn't ask questions about same-sex um, uh, classroom, while heterosexual students were able to ask, uh, ask questions about sex in their sex education classes. In March two, 2017, um, we were asked to put this lawsuit on hold because the state legislature was dealing with these laws. They acknowledged that these laws were antiquated and that they needed to be repealed. And March, uh, by March two, two, by that same month, the Senate Bill 196 in Utah passed, which was a, cr a, a clear uh, repeal of all these laws from the book. The Utah State of Board of Education revised its regulations to comply with the new law, and it agreed to take the additional step of clarifying um, that all manners of discrimination against such students is completely unacceptable. So in that case, we had a win. It's very different from the Rikers case. And um, I believe that this has only happened because of a cultural shift um, and a, uh, 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 um, acceptance of homosexuality. Without that, you know, the state legislature wouldn't have acted had their constituents also not been saying, we want to accept um, homosexuality in, in, in public schools. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk about Foucault. I have yeah, so I would love, I would love to that, that now or later.
I think that there was a very interesting point, which is that, that, you know, if we talk about discrimination, those are very important areas where discrimination is in full force. And, you know, at OutLeaderShip, we love to say that the first place where, where uh, uh, violence and discrimination happens is the family, and then comes the school. And, and usually by the time you graduate from school, the damage, the psychological damage that has been done to you is sufficiently deep that it, 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 it stays with you for your entire lifetime, uh, which has consequences on companies that then hire people that have had that experience of discrimination and violence. So I would love if briefly you could talk oh, about Of course, yeah. Yeah, so um, as you're well familiar with, in the 1970s, the French social theorist Michel Foucault framed these two issues, both incarceration and dominance over LGBT persons together by outlining the modern apparatuses of power that discipline subjects through auxiliary social institutions, such as prisons, hospitals, schools. These institutions are meant to form and to reform deviant persons, deviant persons such as those deviant through criminality or those deviant through sexuality. Um, and they were meant, these institutions were meant to reform them into normality, to be a he this hegemonic concept of normality was created. It is important to know that Foucault did acknowledge that state par power is not always centralized. Each system within a state can be autonomous, but still produce the same effects. So for example, the school system is controlled by a board of education, whereas a prison system might be controlled by the Department of Correction. But there's similar patterns in the foundation of both of these systems that work to discipline those deemed criminal, gay, lesbian, trans, and queer people into normality. In this way, modern control of sexuality parallels modern control of criminality. What is parallel in both is that they use similar techniques. They're constructed in similar ways down to the way they are built. A school is built like a prison. Students' time is accounted for just like an inmate's time is accounted for. There are school bells that sound similar to jail bells signaling a change in schedule. There are racial divides. Very few whites are, are, are at Rikers Island, for example. Similarly, certain schools are racially dominant by one on ethnicity or, or another. The policing of freedom of, of expression, particularly in the Utah case, is a huge way that the state tries to discipline those deviant into normality. In the case where the queer boy uh, sought to tell his princess boy storybook on the, or the boy sought to discuss his uncle and the relationship that he had in, with, with a man, this immediate sponsorship shows that the state tries to discipline those that they can and that social factors even if the law prevents that from ha happening in the future social factors can still censor these students in the case of rikers island however it seems that surveillance was now used as a way not to just enforce the criminals but actually the correction officers due to the to the consent decree so this is essentially a flipping of foucault where the state power, the correction officer, is now being surveilled by another component of the state, the judiciary. So surveillance is a, is a disciplinary method now for the correction officer. But what we're finding is that surveillance is that of, it, it is not preventing or transforming the culture at all at Rikers Island. Their police officers are still brutalizing inmates. Um, surveillance is not and will not be what is going to change the hearts and minds of these corrections officers. Foucault in his book Discipline and Punish showed how states went from using torture and punishment to whipping, whipping sh subjects into shape. And now in modern times, there is a move to the prison due to enlightenment in deals. Um, and so there's, this, there's been the toting of the banner of the prison being the more humane way to discipline society compared to the old methods of torture and punishment. But this, oh, there's an overwhelming, this is a over, the, the overwhelming reality is that pain is still used in prisons. Torture and punishment is still used in prisons. Violence and torture is bleeding into the modern system. The use of pain is still being used discipline. It is still, we're seeing the use of bodies, police officers' body, correction facilitator body to hurt bodies of inmates leaving us with many more theoretical questions. We have to go back to the drawing board 
and we have to figure out what are ways we can change behavior to enforce correction officers to treat inmates humanely because discipline and surveillance are not working. So, so I love the fact that you know UAV and Youth are kind of meeting on that idea that there is a need for a change of culture. And to me, uh, you know, what is striking is the need to show that inmates and formerly incarcerated people are part of community and are deserving of human rights. So, you know, we cannot have this uh, session without talking about COVID-19. I, I think I have two questions for you, A.V., related to COVID-19. One is that Salma mentioned that one person out of 10 in Rikers Island has, has, has been uh, 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 testing positive for COVID-19. Can you yeah. give us a little bit of a summary of what is the, the situation um, in the yeah, U.S.? Yeah. And then my second question, A.V., will be around confinement. I think it must be baffling for you to see uh, people experiencing for the first time some sort of confinement, that, not that it is in any way comparable to, to the restriction of freedom in jail, but do you think that there is something uh, as an activist you can tap into to highlight the inhumanity of mass incarceration uh, through that experience of COVID-19? Um. To your second question, I'll say no, but I'll answer it later. Uh, okay. The reason is I have an, um, and a friend who tells me when she goes to diet camp, she calls it prison. There's an ignorance around prison, around rape jokes. And there are people who tell me they're in solitary confinement because they're home or they're in confinement. It's inconceivable to me because they eat, they're ignorant because you can go get a meal, you can go to the bathroom, you could do whatever you want in your apartment. You can eat, you can sleep, you can watch TV. You can't do anything. In solitary confinement, you, are sit, you have the choice of sitting on a toilet, sitting on a metal bed, or standing up. There's no food. There's no, uh, I mean, there's terrible food, but there's no TV, crossword puzzles, telephones, you just sit in a room. So what I recommend... You cannot bring a book. You cannot... Uh... In some places you can bring a book, but not where I was. But even if you could bring a book, it would be one book, yeah. which you would have to read for six months. Um, I don't want to lose my train of thought. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah. It's... Um, I want everybody to imagine, if you want to know what solitary is, go into your bathroom, close the door, there's the sh where your shower is is the metal bed there's no medicine cabinet there's no window there's no anything for you to do how long can you sit in your bathroom with a locked door for 24 hours and the answer across this country is no people don't raise their hands then i say 12 hours then i say if you want to understand solitary confinement go sit in your bathroom and see how long you could do it without your phone, without your computer, without a book. How long can you sit there? Then talk to me about solitary. But I do want to talk about COVID in prison, if I can. Yeah, please. Um, we have 2.3 million people in prison. And pr the prison situation may be resolved by the fact that nobody's being tested. In Ohio, as of this morning in Marion Correctional in Ohio, 80% have tested positive. Now, just so you understand, if even 1% tests positive, the odds of it transferring to other people are huge because there's no social distancing. There's no possibility. You're on top of each other. You use, there's no gloves, there's no mask, there's no disinfectant. There's, and the soap they give you that you're supposed to wash for 20 seconds, the bar would be gone after one washing and you wouldn't get another one for the rest of the day. To add insult to injury, Cuomo is having uh, upstate New York create enough disinfectant to send down to New York City, but without giving the prison any of that disinfectant. So what I'm going to tell you, and you'll hear it first, I would be surprised if we lost less than a half a million of the 2.3 million. And I expect us to lose a million people out of the 2.3 million because there is a loose, there is a network of formerly incarcerated led organizations, uh, nationally, locally, and statewide. We have listservs. We talk to each other on these listservs. Every single day, 
but there's 5,000 prisons, jails, and, and youth facilities, detention centers. There is active cases in every prison across America. And what, and to make matters worse, I'm going to quote you um, on what's going on besides the high death rate in the judicial system just last week in Louisiana, uh, the federal judge rejected an emergency request for prison release, even though there was a 70% outbreak at FCI, that's Federal Correctional Institute o Oakdale. And then just to give you an example, an appeals court in Texas blocked an order requiring Texas prisoners to receive hand sanitizers and masks. Dallas County prisons are telling guards, don't wear the mask because they may spook the, the um, incarcerated people. So I could go down a list of even a handful of prisons, but I think that the argument for what to do in prison and how to do it is going to change radically because they're going to die. And the question is going to be, what is our response? Even today, to all this death, I, and I, I want to say something, which is, while I say I don't believe in litigation, what I do believe in is um, is not is social a direct action, and I think if you want to close Rikers or you want to have an impact, then you get thousands of people and you stand in front of Rikers and you risk being arrested and you risk being hit by a cop, and then the next batch comes the next day and you have three thousand people's every day until it's closed. Short of direct action where people are willing to put themselves at risk for us, nothing is going to change and we are going to die from COVID. And I hate to be that black and white, but it's that bad. Thank you, Evie. So, uh, 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 Salma, you know, I think we are, we're coming pretty close to time, but I, I had one last question for you, which is that, you know, I love your passion. Uh, it's so, both cases uh, uh, that we discussed today that you worked on as, as a pro bono lawyer uh, sounds sound amazing. So, um, so I, I had two questions for you. First of all, uh, you know, what, what does a firm like Ropes and Gray devote to pro bono? Second of all, do, do they choose a specific focus or do you as a lawyer uh, choose a specific uh, focus for your pro bono practice? And then could you explain to us what role does your pro bono work play in your life? You know, is it, is it, a, is it a way to stay sane? Uh, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is the role? And, and, then, and then, you know, what was your reaction when, when you managed to get to meet this, this success on the Riker case and the success on the Utah case? Okay, great. Yeah, there's Sarah. Bunch of questions, so I'll try to answer them as, as as well as I can, and let me know if I've missed anything. Um, so, Ropes and Gray pro bono is amazing. If you read all of the national surveys, Ropes and Gray is one of the primary law firms for pro bono work. Uh, when I was choosing a firm right out of law school, I chose Ropes and Gray for its uh, commitment to pro bono. In law school, I was a human rights and global justice fellow, and I did human rights and work in Palestine. And after this first experience, it opened my eyes to the ghettoization of communities of colors from the West Bank to our own U.S. Uh, cities. So I decided to switch my international perspective from human rights to, to local civil rights here. And then I worked for the New York Civil Liberties Union uh, for a year while in law school. And then I worked for the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division in SDNY. Um, the Civil Rights Division is the same division that helped with the Rikers Island case, uh, part of Department of Justice. So with these experiences, I knew I needed to go to a firm that really valued uh, my passion for civil rights and human rights, and Ropes was the perfect fit. Uh, Ropes and Gray sets its pro bono policies that actively encourages all its firm attorneys to give back to their community through pro bono work um, by providing equal credit for time spent on pro bono matters as well as time spent on firm paying clients. Um, and so this is a very rare and commendable policy for a top law firm to offer that we get equal credit for our pro bono work. Uh, needless to say, we take our pro bono work seriously. And I have had the opportunity to work on a number of high level cases. Um, and and uh, you know, I feel that this is a public service that I can give back to directly. Rikers Island was one of those cases. In the cases of Rikers Island, Ropes attorneys contributed the 30,000 pro bono hours 
and conducted 57 depositions. When we, um, when we settled the lawsuit, we were awarded a portion of the $6.5 million in attorney fees, which we then turned around and used to fund more pro bono projects, which included the funding of a prison reform council and the Legal Aid Society, and the funding of an Equal Justice, Fellows, um, Equal Justice Works Fellow Program in New York City for 10 years. One of these Equal Justice Fellows was a friend of mine, Bianca Tylik, who attended Harvard Law School, and she went on after the fellowship to, to establish and found the organization Worth Rises. This is an organization that is committed to exposing and dismantling the oppressive and unjust for-profit institutions that capitalize on the on prisoner suffering. So this just goes to show how Ropes and Gray empowers its attorneys to do pro bono work. And then when we win cases and we win back our um, awards, we are able to, uh, our, our attorney's fees, we're able to then reinvest that money back into pro bono projects in the, in the community. And um, pro bono at Ropes and Gray is, is, is what gives me my passion. I, um, my, my commercial work um, centers around anti-corruption. Uh, which is which I'm also very passionate about, and I'm very thankful that I can do work both on the commercial side and the pro bono side that I feel is making a difference. Um, now, with a six month old daughter, I feel even more committed than ever before that she needs to grow up in a world that is less racist, less homophobic, less imperialist. And so I'm really happy that ropes houses me and other attorneys to to do this great work and um, to give us a sense of purpose every day. Yeah, well, that's great. And, you know, Ropes and Gray is one of the member companies of our leadership. We are very proud of your support uh, for LGBT equality. So now I will, uh, I will end the, this talk because I think we just have like two minutes left with UAV uh, to say that today is Giving Tuesday. Uh, so I would encourage anybody that is listening to, uh, to donate to Witness to Mass Incarceration, which is your organization and also to kind of share uh, uh, the link to uh, witness to mass incarceration. I do. Org. But, but Evie, so my, my question to you is, can you describe some of the activities that you do at uh, witness and, and in particular the, the suitcase project, uh, which uh, is really inspiring? Okay. I, if you don't mind, I want to start with something else. If we yeah, just for please. a minute. Okay. Um, the hardest problem we have coming home is no employment. And because of COVID-19, a new industry is developing, which will be testing and contact tracing. Bloomberg Foundation announced 6,400 to 14,000 jobs, and the Rockefeller Foundation is putting money into 300,000 jobs across this country. I want to, I need, if anybody knows someone at either Rockefeller or Bloomberg, I need your help because I want to say, you have a chance to show, you, you claim to be against structural economic inequality. You claim to be for income equality. So here is your chance to do something and change the structure by carving out 500 jobs for formerly incarcerated people who cannot compete with the 30 million people who just lost their jobs. So I am about to start a new program, which I think is crucial since I, uh, I, if we can get in now and get it in people's minds, this is a way you lift up people from poverty. Now, the suitcase project came out of my experience of coming home to no one and being homeless and penniless for 16 months. I asked um, uh, two synagogues to raise $2,000 for three different newly released women and uh, one trans woman. And uh, we did that. We provided a computer, um, a phone with minutes for a year and $600 worth of uh, gift certificates. But as soon as we gave it to three people, I got 135 letters because the demand is so great. I am now being funded, but not as much as I need to be. So all the help you can give me, I can get. UJA is funding me with 40,000, but I need 200. Uh, to build the suitcase project into something in New York, I need a warehouse and I need corporations to make donations so that we can give more people more things that they need. Imagine coming home and it's raining and you have no umbrella. Imagine having a headache and you have you can't afford a $10 bottle of Tylenol. Or you just can't get on the, the metro because you can't afford a card. Or like me, 
I had to make a choice between eating a 30 cent bagel and a dollar piece of pizza. People coming home need your help desperately. They need to be lifted in order to succeed. Otherwise, they disappear. So if anybody knows anybody at Rockefeller or Bloomberg Foundation can help me get a leg in, I'd appreciate it. And please support the work we're doing. And the website is witness to mass incarceration.org, right? Correct. Okay. Well, you know, I have to say that I am in awe. Uh, there's nothing I love more than spending uh, an hour with two very inspiring women that are passionate about social justice. Uh, your experience is heartbreaking, <laughs> uh, but it's also an experience of hope because you turn, uh, you turn your personal challenge into uh, a life of dedication to, uh, to incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people, and, and, and that's, that's inspiring. And, and, and Salma, you, know, you managed to reconcile a, an incredibly successful career and your commitment to human rights, and that's, that's, also, uh, that's also inspiring. So I, 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 just, I was very, very happy to have this discussion with you. Um, I, I hope we, uh, we get to uh, connect again uh, soon on this topic because it is a huge topic, particularly for the United States, where such an incredible percentage of the population is incarcerated. And uh, I, I wish both of you uh, a great week. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.